Stopping the practice of auctioning the very weapons used by killers to take someone's life. It is our top story here tonight on the WHS 11 night team. Hello everybody. I'm Doug Prophet. Tonight a Democrat and Republican in Kentucky are coming together to end the long honored practice by Kentucky State Police of auctioning off the guns. Now the money helps fund police departments. WHS 11 night team's Connor Steffen reports on the bill just filed. In the pain, it gets harder and harder. For Nation Tribune. I want my son back here with me. Loss has become the only constant in life since her 23-year-old son, Mikkel Coleman's death this past July. They found him dead, gunshot wounds. Yeah, it, it was terrible. The tragedy has propelled her into advocacy as she looks to prevent the very same gun violence that took her son. We don't want this to recycle. Two Louisville state lawmakers, one Democrat and one Republican, share her sentiment. The result is Senate Bill 178. Filed this week, it would require Kentucky State Police to destroy any guns used in violent crimes instead of auctioning them off like they do now. This video from KSP shows some of the thousands of confiscated guns they're preparing to auction off to federally licensed firearm dealers next week. It's not clear how many, if any, were used to commit murder. There's no way that that should be auctioned off to no one else. That doesn't make any sense. Under current Kentucky law, about 80% of the revenue generated from KSP auctions is allocated to local police departments like right here in St. Matthews. Officers called the funding crucial. Because you're able to fund police departments to be able to buy equipment that's necessary for them to do their job. St. Matthews Assistant Police Chief Eddie Jones says the department is a recent beneficiary of the program. We were awarded $193,000. Money they used to replace old tasers and handguns, make system upgrades, and launch new training programs. What benefits the smaller departments in the state? It remains unclear what impact the bill would have on this funding. Still, Jones points to what's at stake if smaller police departments lose a critical resource. If they start removing those guns, it's going to hurt police departments out here trying to protect their communities. I want this to be where these guns are not back out in the streets, killing someone else and then destroying somebody else's family. But for grieving families like Nation's, the only thing that matters is preventing more loss and heartbreak. In Louisville, Connor Steff in the WHAS 1119 on your side. More now on this topic, destroying these guns is something Louisville Mayor Craig Greenberg has been pushing for since being elected. In a statement, he says in part, quote, no gun is more important than the life of a loved one. Adding, quote, I thank my Louisville colleagues in the General Assembly for their leadership on ending this recycling of gun violence. Right now, new tonight on the night team, a bill to change the way teenagers are prosecuted for certain crimes is moving forward. A Senate committee in Kentucky approving the proposal that would prosecute teenagers as adults if they're charged with felonies involving guns. It reverses a 2020-2021 law that ended the automatic transfer from juvenile to adult court in certain cases. When explaining his bill, Senator Matthew Deneen from Elizabethtown said youth crime is on the rise and goes beyond Louisville and Lexington. It is our responsibility, I believe, to draw a line in the sand and to say for these types of crimes, these adult crimes, that the punishment should be fitting of the crime. The bill in Frankfurt would allow for a teenager's case to return to juvenile court if prosecutors choose to do it, but Republican Senator Whitney Westerfield argues an automatic transfer still takes away a judge's discretion. Westerfield helped pass that law, by the way, in 2021. But you have robbed the prosecution and the court of weighing the factors that have been in statute since long before I got here, in fact, long before I was practicing law. The seriousness of the offense, whether it was against property, with or a person with greater weight being given to offenses against people, the maturity of the child as determined by their environment, their prior record. The bill will now go to the full Kentucky Senate for consideration there. Right now, the three men charged in one of Bardstown's biggest mysteries, the disappearance of Crystal Rogers appearing in court together for the very first time wearing their jail clothing. And the big news from the hearing today, the judge in Bardstown set a trial date, and it's going to be nearly one year from right now. February 10th, 2025 is the date so far. Prosecutors said today they want to try Brooks Houck, Stephen Lawson, and his son Joseph Lawson all together. At least one defense attorney said he plans to file an objection to that. Plus, will the trial really start in one year? 
We'll have more on that in a moment. But first, our Shay McAllister was in the courtroom covering the hearing. If the prosecutor has it his way, trial will begin one year from now, almost to the day. But so much of that depends on evidence. The prosecutor revealing today he has handed over more than a terabyte worth of evidence in this case coming from the Kentucky State Police, the Nelson County Sheriff's Office and the FBI. All rise. One by one, the men accused of killing Crystal Rogers filed into the courtroom. Joseph Lawson was wheeled in first, followed by his father, Steve Lawson. And then in black and white stripes with cuffs on his wrists, Crystal's former boyfriend, Brooks Houck, took his seat. It was a surprise for all three men to be brought in together, but perhaps a sign of what's to come. So you're going to be filing a motion to try all three cases together, as I take it. And then the prosecutor indicating he hopes to try all three men together in one trial more than a year from now. Jason Ellis and Tommy Ballard mentioned as part of the case file that was initially handed over to the prosecutor, but still no arrests in either of those cases, something a friend of the Ballards thinks will soon change. Well, this is not the only three that's, that's had something to do with it. I guarantee, I'd bet they're what I got in my pocket, that there's more out there that had something to do with this. Back in the courtroom, attorneys for Joseph Lawson were fighting for a lower bond, saying their client isn't a danger to the public. It's obvious that the court can see is that uh, he, he is paraplegic. That's just a fact that exists. But the Commonwealth fought back, pointing to his criminal history, alleged involvement in Crystal's death, and actions after he found out detectives were eyeing him. Once he found out that he was a subject, targeted uh, what happened to this young woman. He called around or texted around to associates, to friends of his, to cover for him, to give him an alibi that, that night of July the 3rd when she's missing. The judge plans to rule on bond by the beginning of next week. And 20 minutes after it started, the defendants left the doors they came in, heading back to the jail cells, where they will wait for the next development in Bardstown's greatest mystery. Today was the first time that Joseph Lawson and Steve Lawson, father and son, saw each other for the first time. We're told no words were exchanged. The next court date in this case has been set for mid-March. In Nelson County, I'm Shay McAllister, WHAS 11 on your side. So let's remind you once again, here's where things stand after today's hearing. And again, it focused on the bond for Joseph Lawson today. That bond currently set at a half million dollars, $500,000. His attorneys again want it lowered down to $50,000. That decision, as we just reported from Shay McAllister, will be coming sometime next week. Stephen Lawson's bond setting at $250,000 after a judge lowered it last month. And the bond for Brookshout, the big one, remains at $10 million. The judge previously denied a request for that bond to be reduced. Now, our legal expert who is following the Crystal Rogers case closely is a former Jefferson County prosecutor with the Violent Crimes Unit. Nick Mudd is now a defense attorney with his Mudd Law Group. He joined me live at 5 today. So what about that trial date for next February? Oh, you think it's an end in sight, but I'm going to tell you it's probably not. Um, a case like this complex, you have A, you have a complex case, B, you have three co-defendants. So you have three, three men charged, uh, you have multiple sets of attorneys, obviously. I know two of the uh, individuals have multiple attorneys, one has a single attorney, uh, and certainly you have 1.1 terabytes of data. That is a huge amount of evidence. And there has to be some smoking gun in that evidence. Mr. Young and Mr. Lasowski are top-notch prosecutors, and they're not going to go forward on a case unless they've got strong evidence to present to a jury. Again, Mudd does not believe the trial will start on time next year. Mudd said that there are benefits to trying all three defendants together, like preventing the same witnesses from testifying several times. He did say, though, we'd be in for a very long trial. You can stay up to date on the, any of the latest developments in this case. Sign up for breaking news alerts on the free WHAS 11 app. And right now, all new on the WHS 1119, President Joe Biden is responding to a new report that says he willfully kept and disclosed highly classified material. But the special counsel recommended no charges against him. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. 
The report also concluded that President Biden did hold on to classified material from his time as vice president, including military and foreign information regarding Afghanistan. The special counsel did note that Biden turned in classified documents and sat for a voluntary interview. I was so determined to give the special counsel what he needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person, five-hour in-person interview. Over the special counsel also called the president's memory into question, calling him a, quote, elderly man with a poor memory, end quote. He also wrote it would be difficult to convince a jury that they should convict.